Hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Lot My Garden. Here we've got various bits and bobs going on today, but uh, here's what's coming up in this episode. Yeah, sent some comments in and everything, so do appreciate all of your really comments. Sort of you. rocketing to seed at the moment, if you can excuse the pun. So, if you can. Okay, so I just wanted to start off by um, saying a few thanks again to people who have um, sent some comments in and everything. So do appreciate all of your comments, thank you. Sorry if I can't get to them straight away, but I'll, I'll most certainly answer them within a couple of days. And uh, there's been a few questions, so I'd just like to um, go through some of the questions that are being asked by some of the, um, the people who subscribe to the channel. And uh, the first one comes from the um, last week I put out an episode regarding uh, Mother Nature Part 1. Um, garden garden chemistry etc and it was when I was talking about the lemonine that you get from orange or lemon or lime peel and that's the white stuff from the inside and uh, there's been a few um, questions from uh, Grumpy Poo, um, Tony, Cannington, Mark um, Davis and uh, Jim from Ravnos um, just to mention a few I know there's been others but they've been asking um, if you can make a spray from it you can make a spray from it, it's a bit hard work to be honest with you. Uh, what you can do is, um, any plants that you've got, obviously what I do is just rub the uh, rub the orange peel onto the uh, the plant, but, but uh, what you can do, if you do want to make some kind of spray to make it easier, or if your plants are a bit more delicate, what you can do is either use, um, you can use orange um, oil or, um, or some other product made from orange, because it, it's Basically, the lemonine is the bit that makes the uh, makes the orange smell. So any any orange product or lemon product is going to have lemonine in it. Obviously, you need to be careful what you're using on plants. So lemon oil is um, is one good one. And for things like trees um, and stuff like that, I have had a question on trees, which I'll come to in a, in a little bit. Um, what you can use is, is washing up liquid, lemon washing up liquid, because the uh, the lemon smell that you get from the washing up liquid is, is lemonine, and also soap is perfectly harmless to plants, um, but it's also something else which affects the, um, the, the respiratory system of, of aphids. So if you're wanting to spray, it's much easier, rather than messing around with orange peels and stuff like that, it's much easier to either get some lemon oil and uh, um, you know, sort of water that down, and then spray that onto your plants, or um, or get some uh, or, or or get some washing up liquid. Simply put that into your um, your squirty bottle, and then just you know, with a bit of water. You don't need anything too strong. Um, if I was to fill up um, a squirty bottle, something like um, you know, sort of something like that size, for example, what I'd do is probably put. A couple of teaspoons of washing up liquid in there, fill it up with water, give it a good shake so that the, uh, the soap's all in there and then just spray that on your plants. You might need to repeat it um, a few times, you know, sort of spray it every day or every couple of days. If the plant's outside and it rains, that's going to wash it off, so obviously as soon as it's rained get back out there and spray it. Um, washing aphids off with water will get them off the plant but it won't kill them so they'll just jump back on the plant and carry on. Um, so. Um, if it, if it does rain and the plant's outside, then give another spray straight after it's, you know, straight after it's finished raining. Um, and I would probably spray a plant sort of two or three times. If the aphids have then gone, then I'd wash it down with all the water, spray some water on or with a hose pipe or whatever, and, and, and just get rid of the soap that way. And uh, that will go into the soil and it, you know, and it won't cause any problems. So that was the first question. Second question comes from um, Katie Lee. Now she was um, talking about slugs. I was talking about... Um, you know, sort of repelling slugs and stuff. Um, and the one um, tip that she's given, uh, which I'd just like to share with everybody, is, is using either pine or spruce needles, um, and then you sort of mulch the strawberries with those. And um, and obviously, when the slugs go onto these um, these these pine needles, and that's obviously they stick into the the underneath of the um, the slug or the snail. And obviously, that's a, you know the slugs don't like that, so they'll turn around and, and, and sort of leave. You can also use 
Um, you can also use crushed pine cones or twigs as another thing. Um, the one thing that I would be careful of is I have heard of this um, sort of pine needle bit before and there is an oil um, in pine um, you know the needles and that in the pine and it can have an adverse effect on, on, on adverse effect on some plants so you need to be careful what plants you're using um, um, Katie Lee did say that, um, that this was only recommended for strawberries in, in, in the book that she's got but um, you know so I would imagine strawberries would be perfectly good they're reasonably hardy plants to be honest with you but um, most certainly for um, other plants you need to be careful um, because the, you know, the, the oils that come from the pine needles may have some sort of bad effect on that um, the next comment comes from um, Life is Better in Wellies, thank you for your comment and this was the one about the plum tree talking about the lemon oil and the aphids and stuff like that again and, and as I've just explained washing up liquid, lemon washing up liquid, fairy lemon or whatever um, sort of diluted in a spray can, spray that on your plants and the, uh, um, your, your trees and then as soon as um, you've got rid of the aphids just wash the tree down or, or the rain will do it for you to be honest with you but um, just, just get the hose pipe and sort of water them down afterwards as soon as all the aphids have gone um, and that, then that should sort you out rather than messing around with the lemon and stuff like that um, obviously if you'd only use washing up liquid then use lemon oil or any other lemon sort of balm type um, fluid that you can you know sort of shake up and, 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 and mix into water I know oil and water don't mix but if you it, you know if you shake it up you can make an emulsion and then sort of quickly spray it on the plants and then that will sort of coat the plants be careful not to put too much oil on plants because that can stop the uh, the leaves from breathing and that so um, you know don't don't put too much oil on a plant um, Obviously, some plants, you know, sort of make oil. That's where most of it comes from. But um, you can, uh, obviously, uh, 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 plants breathe through the leaves, and uh, if you coat the leaves with oil, they're not going to be able to breathe properly. So uh, just just be careful when you when you put it on. If you are using it to to kill the aphids off, put it on, and then perhaps a few hours later, when the aphids have died, just go back and just you know sort of water it all off and get rid of the oil. Obviously, to to get rid of the oil, the best thing to do is to put soap on. So. Um, that's the way to do it. Um, there's been a, um, a comment from Ken Fuller. Thank you, Ken. Um, he was talking about the bananas, using them for um, you know sort of compost and stuff like that. Bananas. I can't praise enough banana skins for fertilisers. They're so, as I explained last time, in the uh, the Mother Nature part, um, they're so rich in minerals. Um, they really are. If you had compost with only bananas in you know you'd have a fantastic garden they you know they really are good I can't sing the praises enough of putting banana skin into the ground because they will uh, put all sorts of nutrition as I explained last time into your ground particularly um, you know sort of potatoes and stuff like that you know it, you know it's a really good um, source of organic um, minerals that you can put into the ground which will in, in, you know in, in, improve your crop no end uh, the next one comes from Nigel in uh, Wolverhampton, alright Nigel, um, he, um, Des Wolves, D-I-S Wolves should I say, and he was talking about the, the onions. Now if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, the video might have gone out last week actually, um, I was talking about the onion curl um, on the leaves. Now thank you to everybody who sent comments, I know I've already mentioned a couple of people who have sent comments in, uh, but um, I did a bit of research with a, um, a friend from work also helped me uh, just have a quick look. And uh, what we've arrived at, we're pretty sure that it is the, the Allium leaf miner, which is a um, small insect. It's only really known to affect gardens in the West Midlands, so in the, you know, the middle part of England, and the southeast of England. However, it, has, um, it is potentially you know, affecting other areas, but it, it's known to affect the West Midlands and the, and the, uh, and the southeast, not quite as much. So uh, because Nigel's had it, he's also in the West Midlands, he's over in Wolverhampton, and I've got it here in Solihull. Um, it, the likelihood is, is that, and I've, I've looked at the, all of the forums on the internet, and I've also looked at quite a few photographs and pictures of people who have had the effect before in the Midlands, and it really does look like that's what I was, um, you know, that I'd got. Now, the, the advice that it, uh, that it says to get rid of them, obviously, is to put fleece over your onions. I'm not going to do it this year, I'm going to see how we get on this year. In the 11 years that I've had this allotment, um, I've only ever had it once, and that was on the um, Stuttgart Giant Onions last year, no others were affected. So what I'm going to do, because this year I'm only really growing turbo onions, I've already got the, set, the sets I showed you a few weeks ago, um, from Wilco's. Um, I'm 
at this moment in time, I think I'm not going to bother putting fleece over. Apart from the fact I've got to go out and buy it, and then I've got to mess around putting some kind of frame up and you know to put it all on. Um, because I've not really been affected that much so far, at least, I'm going to see how I go this year. If I do have a problem again this year, then obviously next year I'll be looking at putting um, you know some kind of frame together and the fleece over the onions, etc. But um, for now. Rather than um, sort of going overboard with this, I'm, 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 I'm probably going to leave it and then see how I go. Um, as I say, out of the 26 plots that are here, there was only myself and my next door neighbour who um, was affected by it. And all of the onion sets came from the same place. So that's why I was thinking were the onion sets in, um, um, affected before I actually got them. And I had um, four or five different varieties of onions five onions, uh, five varieties of onions last year and there was only the Stuttgart giants which were affected. So as long as I don't grow Stuttgart giants I think I might be alright so I might get away with it so we'll see how we go anyway. Watch this page, um, uh, I might be saying something different in a few months time when all the onions have curled over but uh, um, I had a question from um, Proverbs 31, thank you for all of your comments um, and she was saying how, how big is an allotment? They can vary. Um, when um, during the Second World War, when they were all, most of them were set out. They were all um, set out um, according to um, the the government at the time. Obviously, they were trying to encourage people to grow their own vegetables, which is where most of the allotments came from. Um, unfortunately, we've lost most of them now, probably. But uh, the the ones that remain that we've all got um, tend to be um, 108 feet long and um, 25 feet wide, somewhere in that region. From place to place, obviously, if they've got a field, they're going to chop the field up into um, given amounts. Your, your allotments might be slightly wider or slightly narrower, longer or, or whatever, but the, the area that you should have is going to be something like 2,700 feet, uh, which sounds a lot, but it, it, trust me, as soon as you start planting it, that isn't a lot. In metres, um, that's 32 metres long and just over 32 metres in fact 32 metres long and 8 metres wide which gives you 256 square metres that's in metric obviously so 2,700 feet 256 square metres and uh, that's your, your average kind of, sort of size plot from speaking to um, different people from different areas and also watching YouTube videos and stuff like that where people have said how big their allotments are. I actually think the majority of plots are actually that size or at least that area. Um, there are people um, that I've seen on YouTube which seem to have considerably smaller plots um, than that but um, most certainly um, in this area all of the people that I know that have got allotments they're pretty much that size. So. Um, I think, um, it, it, it's something like a quarter of a hectare or something, I can't remember the old English um, size of it, but basically you're looking at something that's 108 feet long and 25 foot wide, that's pretty much the standard. As I say, as the shapes of the fields change, um, you know, it, it might be made narrower and wider or whatever to suit the, you know, the land that you've got, but um, that's pretty much the, um, the size that you've got. So the next... Um, the next question comes from Mark Davids, and he was asking me about the MIG welder that I use. I've got a semi-professional MIG welder that I bought from uh, Machine Mart. It's a Clark's. I think it's the largest one that Clark's do. Now, I can't remember the power off the top of my head. Um, I'll put a note down here now uh, to, uh, to tell you the model and the power. But um, I've had a number of welders in the past. I um, started off at the age of probably um, eight or nine. Um, when I had uh, a stick welder or an arc welder, uh, which are incredibly difficult to use, I wouldn't recommend anybody get one of them. Um, and I had that for for a couple of years and decided arc welding wasn't my thing. So then I got a MIG welder. I got a small one, um, and which was all right for doing small sort of bodywork bits and on cars and stuff like that. But really, there's not enough um, sort of power in it. And then I had another one which was similar. Um, and then I. Um, I've got the one that I've got now and I've had it for 11, 12 years and it's, it's never really let me down. The things with MIG welders is if you're going to go and buy one, get a good one because there's a lot of small ones out on the market um, and um, the smaller ones tend to be sort of underpowered really for what you want to do and um, 
and they tend to break down a lot more. The winding mechanism which sends the wire up, um, that's that's normally the bit that goes wrong to be honest with you. And what you don't want is a um, the winding mechanism to keep playing up with you because it, it makes welding miserable. My welder, I can turn it on and weld. There's no messing around. I turn the gas on, turn the power on, and then just weld with this. Obviously, I adjust it to whatever I'm welding. But uh, the smaller ones, you tend to be constantly faffing about, and the wire doesn't feed properly, then it blocks the tip up, and then because of that, you get another problem. Then the gas doesn't work properly, and it, uh, yeah. so you're much better off spending a bit of money, going out, getting a good one, and then you'll be you know, you'll be welding so much better. And don't forget to get a good quality mask as well, one that, you know, a, a reacting mask, that pays dividends. Um, but as I say, I'll put the model number down. One from Ray Green, he says, how do you heat your greenhouse methods? When I was younger, I used to grow a lot of fuchsias. When I was doing that, I used to have two paraffin heaters in the greenhouse. I know I had both of them on at the same time. But what I'd do is, um, I'd burn paraffin in the greenhouse. Burning paraffin's good because the the product that it gives off is obviously water, which is you know harm, harmless to the plants if it, if it's burning properly. So I did have um, two or three uh, over the over the years I was growing fuchsias when I was younger. Um, I had a number of um, paraffin burners. Um, one which was one with pipes on that went underneath the bench. So you've actually got the heater in the middle, and then you've got pipes running out to the length of the greenhouse. So that would distribute the heat all underneath the bench where you got your plants. I also had an upright, I've had a couple of upright ones as well which is just sit in the middle and then that generates the heat and obviously you put plastic around as well to keep the heat in. Um, now I don't really bother heating to be honest with you, what I do um, from a cost perspective because it, it, it can be quite costly heating a greenhouse with, um, with, with anything really. Um, I have made a, um, a hot box where you've basically got um, a wooden box um, which used to sit here. I haven't used it for a couple of years, uh, but that's a box with a um, a metal base, and then you put um, gravel in the bottom of the uh, of the base. Then underneath that, what you place is a couple of 60 watt bulbs. Uh, you can actually get away with actually less than that. So you know, a couple of 20 watt bulbs will do it. And then the bulbs sit underneath, and basically, obviously, you power the bulbs with the electricity. The bulbs generate heat. You paint the underneath of it black. And then that heats the bottom of it up. So normally with plants in the in the winter, you need the heat from the bottom, and obviously the heat rises and then all you know will warm the plant. So it's normally the roots that need the heat in the winter. Um, and I have also last year, I don't know if you saw me, I actually put a video out where we had a couple of cold snaps as soon as I got the stuff going. I don't normally plant stuff till back end of February. Um, March time anyway, so by then, by far the majority of the frosts have gone. So I, I'm only looking just to keep the frost off any seedlings that I've got in here. And what I do there is the is the classical um, classical trick, and this has been on my videos. It's also been on other people's videos on YouTube as well. And basically, all you do is you get a couple of brick ends and a big um, pitcher pot, um, and then basically what on on top of the two bricks. There's there's a few variations of this, but the way I do it is I put um, a um, two bricks and a um, uh, a roof tile, and then I put a candle in the middle, light the candle, and then you put a uh, a smaller pot over the candle with the hole um, open, and then you put a large pot, one of the um, sort of 12 inch, 14 inch pitcher pots over the top of that, not plastic pitcher, over the top of that, and then block the hole with just a piece of. Um, you know, broken pot over the top, and then that candle will burn for probably about three or four hours, and that's more than enough to keep the greenhouse frost-free over um, over the night. As it's said by other people on on um, on um, YouTube, the best ones are the church candles, but um, you can get um, uh, just the just the tea lights, whatever you call them, the uh, the small sort of flat ones. If you put a couple of them in, uh, that's more than sufficient. Um, but um, just just a normal. I've used table candles as well. You know the ones that are about that big, and they'll burn for you know a couple of hours. The tea, the the little tea candles only burn for about half an hour. But that's more than enough to get the pot hot, and then the pot will then give off the heat and keep the greenhouse wet. So that's more than enough for a night. I wouldn't set them on fire or you know light the candles until later on in the night. So I would probably say light your candles around um, ten o'clock at night. That's really when you need it. And then that'll warm up, and then as soon as it gets to sort of four o'clock in the morning, things will start to warm up anyway. So that'll take you through the night. But um, I'll try not to bother if I can now, to be honest with you. The next one's from um, Ken Fuller again. Um, he was talking about um, parsnips, carrots, forking. And um, there's two reasons for um, 
um, parsnips and carrots. And I'm going to come on to this in a, in a couple of episodes time when I'm when I'm showing you how to make the parsnip germinator. Um, but um, both parsnips and carrots are a similar vegetable. You you have a, a very thin root go down to start with, which is like the tapping root. This is the root that fattens up and, and, and generates the carrot or the um, uh, the uh, carrot or the parsnip. And that's the root, the tapping root, that's the one that's looking for the water. So that's the one that goes straight down after the water table. And then you get all the little roots that go sideways, which are looking for the nutrients. So. The two things that cause carrots or parsnips to split into fork, you know, sort of, you know, go into two or wherever, or become short, is when you damage that root or that root hits a stone. Um, and basically, what will happen then is you'll you'll basically stop the growth. It doesn't grow as big because it can't get to the water, and the root doesn't tend to go around anywhere. So uh, that's the one way. The second way that you can get them to fork is if you put muck in the ground. If you're putting carrots or parsnips into the ground, what you don't want to do is put fresh muck into the ground. Parsnips aren't typically that bad. You can get away with it with parsnips as long as the muck's broken up. Carrots, you don't want the uh, the muck to be um, in the ground because what it'll do, it'll it'll force it to break and try to get to all the goodness. So uh, with with carrots, most certainly use things like fish, um, fish blood, bone meal, um, stuff like that. Grow more. Um, uh, if, if, if you're not looking at it sort of quite organically or um, things like that but you don't want to put a lot of muck or sort of vegetable matter in the ground if you're going to go carrots there because it'll it'll force the carrots to break and, and you know sort of fork off so those are the best tips but I'll, I'll come on to that in more detail in the next few weeks um, the next one's from Nora Hepburn thank you for all your comments Nora bless you um, she was saying um, have I got a sense of anticipation that springs on its way? God, yes, I have. I know it's just round the corner. And I can't wait to get out there and do stuff. Absolutely. Um, I think you can hear that in my voice. Um, and the last one, again, another one from Nigel. He put a quick tip on there, which I think is really good. I've fell foul of this before in the past. Um, last week I mentioned about putting um, blueberry bushes in where the raspberries are at the moment. And he said, um, make sure that the pH of the soil is acidic, so it's around 5, 5.5. Yes, Nigel, you are exactly right. I had the same problem myself. Um, three years ago I put two blueberry bushes actually in my garden and both of them died because I hadn't put irrigation compost and, and other stuff to make the uh, the soil acidic. To do this you can either put um, um, irrigation compost as I say, things like tea bags, um, obviously muck is acidic, um, things like this you want to put in there, obviously not lime because that's the opposite of what you want, but uh, yeah you need to be putting stuff into the ground which is acidic when you're putting these things in there and obviously if you are being quite sort of scientific about it, get yourself some universal indicator paper, make up the soil and then just test it to make sure that you are around the same pH before you plant the plant, but if you get irrigation compost that is most certainly the best thing that you can put at least in the immediate vicinity of the um, uh, the bush and then in following years mulch with muck and um, and obviously if you've got any tea bags or anything like that or any or any used tea put that on the ground because that will also help to keep the pH down or, or the acidity low so I know I've gone through that really quickly but I've got all the bits and bobs to put in this video and I want to try and keep it down to half an hour so. okay just a quick note the uh, the rockets really sort of rocket into seed at the moment if you can excuse the pun so if you can just keep keep taking out these early uh, centre bits if they get a bit woody just get the um, secateurs and chop them off to try and stop running to seed but um, at this time of year because of the weather's temperature etc you know they will you know they really will be fighting against you know they're trying the damnedest to go to seed um, but um, that's what the uh, the rocket looks like at the minute just a quick quickly show you I've brought in um, the um, lavender plants from outside obviously to give them a bit of a head start and um, I've just put the uh, the rosemary um, plant up here as well, they do look very similar to each other don't they, you can tell they're both a herb um, but the um, I've noticed this week because they're in the greenhouse these have started to shoot, now this was one um, these are hydrangeas um, the cuttings that I took back in um, sort of October time last year if you remember and if you can see, even though the leaf's died off, you can see the new growth has started to come through now. 
so these are clearly rooted but what I will do I'll leave them in there now for another uh, month or so because um, I don't really want to disturb any roots that are possibly on there I'll let them to start to grow and as soon as we've got a few leaves on there not too many leaves because obviously you know when I take them out and separate them it's going to disturb the roots and the roots need to support the leaves so what I'll do in the next month or so I'll take them out of there, pop them up into some fresh compost separately in, in, in uh, the different pots and uh, repot this one into a bit um, fresher, fresher um, compost and uh, they'll they'll shoot off next year, and and you know no doubt they'll um, they'll be growing like bilio over the uh, uh, during the spring and this year. So that's the uh, the greenhouse for now. There's not a lot outside that I can show you to be honest with you, because um, it's all pretty well. Um, you, you know, there's not a lot out there apart from water and coldness to be honest with you. But um, I'm really pleased with the um, uh, the sundial. That's still going quite strongly. Uh, it's not the sundial, what we're talking about, the weather vane. So that's still uh, going quite nice, as you can see. It's doing its thing. Um, and the uh, the strawberries and everything like that are all, you know, sort of not really doing much at the moment at all. So, But but no doubt in the next few weeks they'll start to um, shoot up. But um, that's what the allotment looks at the moment. Obviously I'm not out there this week because it's, uh, it's far too cold and wet and windy to do anything at the moment, which is unfortunate. But uh, it's only around the corner. Spring is on its way. So just to quickly show you the drain, this has been emptied two times um, in the last uh, week and as you can see it's filled to the top again so I'll be again tonight um, pumping this out with the, uh, with the pond pump to empty it so the, uh, so the ground can drain but we have had a reasonable amount of rain and stuff over the last week or so so I'll be uh, pumping this out again but as you can see even though I've emptied it um, twice it's filled back up again so I'll be uh, just let you know what's going on with the drain so that's obviously doing its job which is all good so uh, that's what's happening with the, uh, with the drain this week so thanks for watching this episode of Jim's Allotment Garden please do drop your comments below um, and thank you to all the subscribers of the channel I do appreciate your support and I'll see you on the next edition of Jim's Allotment Garden